Well, novelty is not necessarily good or nice. Novelty is complex. That's what it is. And so I see really a concatenation of uh, tendencies and uh, forces here at the end. It's only going to get weirder. The level of contradiction is going to rise excruciatingly, even beyond the excruciating present levels of contradiction. <laughs> so uh, I think it's just going to get weirder and weirder and weirder. And finally, it's going to be so weird that people are going to have to talk about how weird it is. And at that point, novelty theory can come out of the woods uh, because eventually people are going to say, what the hell is going on? It's just too nuts. It's not enough to say it's nuts. You have to explain why it's so nuts. So between now and uh, 2012, the next 14 years, I look for the invention of artificial life, the cloning of human beings, uh, possible contact with extraterrestrials, possible human immortality, and at the same time, appalling acts of brutality, genocide, race baiting, uh, homo phobia, famine, starvation, because uh, the systems which are in place to keep the world sane are in utterly inadequate to the forces that have been unleashed. Uh, the collapse of the socialist world, the rise of the internet, these are changes so immense, nobody could imagine them ever happening. And now that they have happened, nobody even bothers to mention what a big deal it is. Uh, the fact that there is no such thing as the Soviet Union, people never talk about it anymore. But when I was a kid, the, the notion that that would ever change was beyond conceiving. Uh, so the good news is that as primates, we're incredibly adaptable to change. Put us in a desert, we survive. Put us in the jungle, we survive. Under Hitler, we survive. Under Nixon, we survive. We can put up with about anything. And it's a good thing because we're going to be tested to the limits. Uh, uh, the breakdown of anything. And this is why the right wing is so alarmed. Because what they see going on is the breakdown of all tradition all order, all sanctioned norms of behavior. And they're quite right that it's happening, but they're quite wrong to conclude that it should be resisted or is somehow evil. Uh, the mushroom said to me once, it said, this is what it's like when a species prepares to depart for the stars. You don't depart for the stars under calm and orderly conditions. It's a fire in a madhouse. And that's what we have, the fire in the madhouse at the end of time. This is what it's like when a species prepares to move on to the next dimension. The entire destiny of all life on the planet is tied up in this. We are not acting for ourselves or from ourselves. We are, we happen to be the point species on a transformation that will affect every living organism on this planet at its conclusion. Hello, and welcome to Alchemical Connections. This is Chrissy McMahon, your host, on this auspicious day after the end of time, December 22nd, 2012. And I'm coming to you uh, from a ship <laughs> in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, heading to uh, Cozumel. And uh, actually today, I will be venturing onto the Mexico mainland to explore the Tamal uh, ruins of the ancient Mayans. And in honor of this, uh, this wonderful time, or end of time, or beginning of time, however you choose to look at it, I chose to um, present the interview that I had with Rupert Sheldrake. And um, I'd like to incorporate within this interview a lot of different information that pertains to consciousness and the changing paradigm that 
we see happening all around us and to help to foster some more thought and understanding and awareness of what it is our potential and our goal in these uh, wonderful changing times. Um, thank you all for listening and I hope you enjoy this presentation. Hello, Rupert. Good. Okay. Okay. Hello and welcome to Awake Radio. I'm your host, Chrissy McMahon. Today is December 5th, 2012. And my special guest is Rupert Sheldrake, author of 10 books over 80 scholarly publications. He is considered an innovative bi biologist and has completed important research in, in crop studies and crop circles, telepathy and the paranormal, physics, psychology, and philosophy. Rupert's new book, Science Set Free, 10 Paths to New Discoveries, turns 10 scientific creeds into questions, challenging everyone to look beyond the dogma of modern science and, in, and its views of me the mechanical universe. Thank you very much, Rupert, for agreeing to speak with me today. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to start with, um, there's two questions that I have that I, I think are very relevant to your work concerning the paranormal and metaphysical. Number one is the observer effect in quantum mechanics. Um, I have studied uh, a little about quantum consciousness and the evidence of the observer effect at the quantum level. Would it be correct in assuming that the quantum effect of the observer is happening at the macro level of physical 3 or 4D reality? Are we only to assume this effect is observed within quantum mechanics is limited to the quantum level? Meaning, can we at the physical level, and I believe there's evidence to support this, expect that the observer continues to affect the experiment on all levels? What are the implications, in your opinion, for objective research? Well, um, the observer effect in quantum physics is to do with the fact that the kind of experiment you do affects what you're looking at. Um, it really amounts to the rather general and, in fact, slightly obvious point that all observations require observers. Um, and what it tells us in quantum physics is that the observer interacts with what's being observed through the apparatus. Now, and maybe also by just observing it itself has an effect. Now, this is usually, as you say, confined to the quantum level in people's thinking. But actually, I think it's much more widespread. Um, and the, where I've looked at it is in the everyday phenomenon that most people have experienced of the feeling of being stared at. Lots of people have had the experience of being looked at. They turn around, someone's staring at them, or uh, they stare at somebody, uh, and then that person turns around. Mm -hmm. More than 90% of the population have experienced that uh, phenomenon, so it's very, very common. Um, I looked, I found this was a subject there had been virtually no research on when I got interested in this in the 1980s. Um, it's a completely taboo subject because from the point of view of regular science it ought not to happen. Okay. The, the mind's supposed to be inside the brain so it shouldn't affect anyone at a distance. But it does seem to happen. There's now been lots of experiments that show this is real. It happens between people and people and between people and animals and between animals and people and between animals and animals. And I think it probably evolved in the first place in the context of predator-prey relationships. Animals that were pre prey, potential prey, if they could detect when they were being looked at, would survive better than if they couldn't. So I think this is a, it's a bit like the observer effect in quantum physics, but at, at the other end of the spectrum, as it were. Oh, very good. Um, I agree. And, uh, and I've had conversations with uh, biologists who have disagreed that they didn't think that it affected anything beyond the quantum level, but I wanted to ask you because I thought you would have much more <laughs> closer to the reality, I believe, of what mm. we're seeing. So my second part, was it's really like second part of the question, how does this effect play out in daily lives as we are bombarded with untold numbers of news reports on the most heinous to what borders on diabolical? 
how do we proceed in this climate of awareness? Do we continue to research the information that is decidedly negative and unwanted, seeking solutions, or could we effectively ignore the unwanted reports and develop a coherent vision of a world in health and prosperity, or is there some middle way? Well, I think we're, we always have to, we all have to be incredibly selective about what we read and do, and we have to be anyway. It's not just a matter of choice because you know you walk into a bookshop like Barnes and Nobles, and you see thousands and thousands of books stretching into the far distance, and there's no human being alive could ever read all those. You go on do an internet search on something, you get a million hits, and no one alive is ever going to read all those. So we're overwhelmed with information. And we have to be immensely selective. Um, I think the internet enables us to be more selective than newspapers. The newspapers, they filter the information for us, and so do radio and TV programs. I'm rather glad they do because it saves one a complete overload. But we also have considerable choice. And I, I, I know that if one turns on television, I mean, a great deal of it is to do with violence and murders and dramas based on murder and that kind of thing. Yes. In real life, most people don't encounter that many murders, but switch on TV and you have dozens of them in, in a single evening. Absolutely. Um, and video games, which involve children and young people sort of killing thousands of thousands of people, it's considered perfectly normal in our culture for young children to be mass killers on a scale that would, you know, would have been beyond the wildest dreams of a Gestapo guard in, in, in the Second World War. Uh, and it's absolutely incredible to me that we think of this as perfectly normal and parents are perfectly happy for their children to do it. Um, we don't have to focus our attention on such negative things and we don't have to allow our children to. Um, and I think it's better to focus on things that are more positive and uplifting, although, of course, we have to be aware of the world we live in, including negative factors at work in it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's very difficult. And I think coming from a political viewpoint of the things that are happening to move it into a more metaphysical or spiritual understanding of the world and, and how to interact within it and within ourselves, that um, I think this question is difficult. You know, I, I want to ignore the things that I don't really want to look at, but I also know that um, I want to help people understand the truth of their of this reality. Mm. But maybe how, how can we bridge that? How can we bridge um, my understanding of the reality with someone who doesn't ha doesn't share the same uh, view of of what we're seeing? I mean, how how can well, we... Well, that's a help? hard one, isn't it? I mean, how do we influence other people? Um, you know, there's plenty of people out there giving good advice and sermons and exhortations to better behavior, but um, people don't always pay much attention. I mean, the, it's often said that the best way is through example. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think we have to live what we believe. Uh, it's, no one's going to believe us otherwise, and we're not going to be, have much influence if we don't of what we believe. So there is a kind of personal responsibility element. Yes, uh, I agree. And um, I think that, that pretty much is, is where we should be focusing on. Um, I have another question from a friend, um, the individual I told you about, Dave Murphy. Um, he's very interested in uh, uh, telepathy. And um, his questions were, you briefly touched on this the spellbind spellbinding of oh, that's my question <laughs> the spellbinding of language at your presentation at Haverford College my friend Dave Murphy asks do you think language suppresses human telepathic ability um, I'm not sure about that because human telepathic ability is um, pretty well developed in African tribes and in, in, in the traditional cultures. I would say it's better developed in our own, but it's not as if they don't have language. They do have language. Um, I think they, many of them can't read and write. I think literacy may suppress it, um, but all humans have language and many humans have better telepathic skills than people in modern industrial societies. So um, I don't think it's language as such that suppresses it. Um, 
but possibly literacy and education. I suspect that um, people who focus a great deal on the kind of left brain literate side of their being uh, are less intuitive than people who are more holistic or emotionally responsive. Um, so, yes, I mean, it may be that humans, even maybe all humans, are less telepathic than, say, dogs or wolves or animals in the world that don't have language. It may be that language has led to some de degree of suppression, but literacy and modern education seem to lead to even more. So uh, I just don't know to what degree chimpanzees or um, gorillas or apes and things, sort of wild primates that are our cousins, um, I don't know to what extent they're telepathic. Um, and I don't think anyone really knows. It's rather hard to study. I asked Jane Goodall about this once. She studied chimpanzees in the wild. And although she thinks they do have kind of telepathic communication with each other, it's not something she could easily observe because to do that you'd have to know what their thoughts and intentions were. Mm -hmm. and you don't really know that, especially if they're in the wild. Yeah. That's interesting. It's it's something I never thought about. but um, I imagine that we all have some kind of telepathic abilities that are innate that we that we're not aware of and I think our diet and the constructs of culture and society probably inhibit it further and um and you've written a lot about that so um another question or maybe statement Dave says he also stated in it in his view we are picking up external thoughts all the time but our brains screen them out until we can link them to an external thought like to an audiovisual stream. What do you think is the mechanism behind telepathy? Well, I think telepathy depends on close social bonds. Um, it typically happens between people who are strongly bonded with each other, mothers and babies, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, twins, close friends, um, close colleagues. It doesn't typically happen with complete strangers. So, and the same is true in animal groups. It happens between members of the group, um, but not just with random animals. Um, so, and it happens, of course, between animals and people, between dogs and their owners. I wrote a whole book on this, Dogs That Know When Their Owners mm -hmm. Are Coming Home, um, about bonds, telepathic bonds between people and animals. And those are very common and uh, but again, they show, show the same principle. Most dogs, about 70% of dogs, only respond to one person coming home. They don't respond to other members of the household. They respond to the person they're most closely bonded to. Some dogs do it to two people, a few to three. But it's it, essentially the people they're closest to that they respond to. Um, so I think that the way telepathy occurs is to do with the bonds between members of groups, which I interpret in terms of my theory of morphic fields. Um, so I think these fields link together bonded members of groups, and the fields stretch when we move apart. They don't break, so we remain connected at a distance. And so I think that's how telepathy works. That's wonderful. And our time is about finished, so um, I'd like to ask you if you would like to share any closing thoughts or give your website or anything? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, the the most recent statement of all my views is in my book, Science Set Free, and um, that was published a couple of months ago by Random House. My website is www.sheldrake.org, um, sheldrake.org. And on it, I have a telephone telepathy test, one that works on cell phones, and I invite anyone who's interested to try it for themselves. You need two friends or family members to do it with you. It takes less than an hour, it's fun to do, and it explains on the website at the online experiments portal how to do it. So do have a go. Wonderful. And thank you so much, Rupert, and have it's a wonderful pleasure. evening. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Chrissy. Bye. Good night. Bye for now, then. Yes.
Hi, this is Chuck. And this is Karen. And this is our show. What if it really works? A practical guide to spirituality. And the two people we have sitting before us are... Dr. Dean Wrighton, who is with the Institute of Noetic Sciences here in Petaluma, California. He's a senior researcher for them. You've been with the Institute for quite some time, haven't you? Yeah. About 12 and a half years now. Yeah. And Dr. Tom Campbell, who is from uh, is an astrophysicist from NASA, and he lives in Huntsville, Alabama. So we're, he is the author of the My Big Toe, T-O-E, Theory of Everything. And Dr. Raiden is, uh, has written his latest book, is Entangled Minds, Extrasensory Experiences in a Quantum Reality. And we brought you these two gentlemen today because they have such divergent viewpoints and yet they have so many things that they have in common in regard to the work that they do so we'd like to sh share them with you today so we appreciate both of you being here with us well thank you Karen thank you so let's let's begin at, with a simple question what is consciousness <laughs> well 25 words or less yes. <laughs> what, is, what is consciousness to give you the short answer, consciousness is a information field. Consciousness is information. Reality is information. And consciousness is a digital information system. Okay, now that's, I'm not sure that gives you the, what is consciousness? There's lots of ways then from there that you can, you can bubble this up. Um, we have the, the consciousness that people talk about like I'm conscious and you're conscious and I would call that little c consciousness that's that's kind of our local awareness if you will and then I think of a a big c consciousness which is the larger consciousness system and that's this digital information field mm -hmm. so it starts from the idea that uh, reality is information whether it's our sense information which defines you know this physical reality to us uh, there's more to it than just that, because consciousness is much bigger than just this physical reality. It, uh, physical reality, I guess I should say, uh, um, the concept that um, reality is objective. Okay, that's what we think of in this physical reality. This is an objective reality. Reality is objective only in a, an approximation. In a larger view, reality is this digital information field and where the uncertainty is small then it approximates being objective and that's where the physical world then and the well, I shouldn't say the physical world there's lots of things in the physical world that have lots of uncertainty and they appear not to be too objective but that's the that kind of defines the objective reality that traditional science works in the hard sciences work in it's a it's an approximation um, a subset of a larger reality. Just like um, Newtonian physics is a subset of a larger reality described by relativity and quantum mechanics. And it's not that Newtonian physics doesn't work anymore, it works very well, but only within the range, you know, where it, where it holds, which means not too small, not too fast. Then Newtonian physics is, is good, useful physics. But it's only a subset of a much bigger view. And then when you expand that view out again, you find out that quantum mechanics and relativity are just a subset of a bigger view. And objective physics is an approximation within a subset. So consciousness is information, if uh, in the you know, 25 words or less version. <laughs> Yeah, I've been counting it overall. It's way more than 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> it was, wasn't it? Uh, we had a, a talk here the other day by uh, Peter Russell, a well-known consciousness researcher, and he, he said something I hadn't heard before, which is if you take the word consciousness and you think about what Ness does to it at the end, it, it takes a process and it turns it into a noun. And so we, we talk about consciousness as though it is a thing, an object. And it really isn't. It's a process. So we, he, he talks about it in terms of awareing. Like instead of talking about consciousness, we should talk about awareing because it's about awareness, but it's a process, something mm -hmm. that's happening. And ultimately, it, if you keep going down this, this rabbit hole, you, you do end up with information. So I think a lot of physicists and philosophers are ending up with the notion that at, at bottom, as best as we can tell, there's something like 
relationships or information in some sense. Mm -hmm. So I agree with that. Stopping just. Interviewed Peter Russell about six months ago when he was at the uh, Monroe Institute in mm -hmm. favor. We were we happened to be there at the same time, mm -hmm. and and so I hadn't heard him say it the way that you just said it, which is very interesting information. I think, I think this was a new a new way of presenting it. Yeah. He was he was kind of toying with so, and I like it too. I like it too. Yeah. yeah. So, what did you hear in Tom's description of consciousness that you understood, didn't understood, dis <laughs> disagreed with, have questions about? No, I think I agree with everything he said. That uh, ultimately, our best description of the physical world is quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics at base is about information, and that actually fits in somewhat with uh, the yogic lore. Or actually, most of the the ancient ideas, ancient esoteric ideas about the nature of reality, that uh, consciousness is wrapped in in some way. I mean, depending on which particular philosophy you go to, but it, Eastern philosophies in general put much more emphasis on the fundamentals of consciousness and the rest of the world emerging from that. And if that's the case, and one way, a word that we can use to describe that is something like information or knowledge or relationship, that sort of thing. So, so you have this interest, uh, Dean, in, in understanding these uh, extra scientific instances. Do you have the sense that a lot of this information has been in the mystical literature for a long, long time, and we haven't been able to take that route to find it? I wouldn't call any of this extra scientific. I mean, the experiences are what they are. People talk about strange flows of information from one place to the other, and the role of science then is to figure out uh, how do we tell the difference between uh, a hallucination and fraud from something that's real. So most of my work has focused on, on the issue of how do we know in principle whether the supposedly anomalous experiences like telepathy or precognition, how do we know that that's actually real? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where the, the scientific road has been traveling down over the past century and a half to see A, is it real, and then B, if it is real, what are the parameters that define how to make it better or worse? And then further down is how do we create theories that don't do too much violence to what we know about the rest of the world that also explain these kinds of phenomena? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's what that enterprise is all about. And you find that in, in some of the ancient literature there are clues to this, yes? I think I'd say that on almost all of the ancient wisdom literature, it's talking about the same stuff, but from cultural perspectives where they didn't have the language that we have now. So they, you know, if you, if you go back into the Vedas, for example, uh, a Vedic scholar would say, well, clearly this portion of the Vedas is talking about relativity or quantum mechanics or something like that. But it's a bit of a stretch to do that because the, there, there aren't any mathematics in the Vedas, at least the, uh, not as written, so they're interpretations. And the same goes for almost every esoteric tradition, that there's words that are used that are enculturated by the times and pointing. I would say it's more like pointing at what we're seeing now at the leading edge of science rather than describing it, because we have different, different language mm -hmm. and different ways of describing things now. This is why I think, actually, that the, the future of science will intersect with the, the ancient past. Like the wisdom of the past, the future of science will intersect and both will be better as a result. Because either one alone is actually not the full picture. The ancient wisdom is pretty good, but they didn't have an iPhone. So you know, we learned something, <laughs> something new, and the, the hope is that we, with the, the new integration, that we learn fast enough so we don't accidentally uh, obliterate ourselves with technologies that are way more powerful even that we've already made. So a lot of the ancient wisdom is all about uh, getting your moral, uh, moral sense and ethics right so that you don't accidentally blow yourself and everyone else up. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you have any insight into that? Oh, well, I agree with Dean entirely. Uh, you can go back almost to the, the very first written documents that we have, you know, 4,000 years B.C. or so. That's probably when the Vedas and, and most of that um, uh, was being written. And you will find a lot of wisdom, a lot of things that are obviously true, true based on your own experience, 
but not true in the sense of scientific facts. They're, it's poetry. It's descriptive of experience. You know, this is, these are the things that I understand to be true, and here's why, and here's how you should live your life, and here's, here's what's important and what's not, and so on. It's very descriptive like that, but that's a f different animal than, than science. In order for that to become kind of modern day scripture, if you will, then we have to appeal to what I call the uh, high priests of science. You know, science is kind of the fundamental religion, if you will, of Western culture. Uh, I say that in a sense that, uh, you know, the priests of old used to tell the people kind of what to believe, what was right, you know, how did it work? And uh, now the scientists tell us in Western culture what to believe. If science says this is bogus and a bunch of crap, then most of the people won't think about it anymore. You know, that's it. They've been, they've gotten the word from the people who know. And instead of being the priests of, you know, what, four or five centuries ago, now it's the scientists, you know, of the 21st century. So in order to make what was kind of ancient wisdom into modern science, you have to find a way in which it all makes logical sense. In other words, you need an overview that pulls it all together, that indeed does, as Dean says, one day we're going to see, you see, that, that what's written, you know, what the Buddha said, what's written in the Vedas, what's, uh, um, you know, what we've learned, and it's not just Eastern religions, you know, we have, we have it through all sorts of mystical traditions. The problem is, some of it is, is very valuable, and we think of it as, as obvious truth, and some of it is kind of quirky that we think of as maybe dogma or somebody's imagination. How do you sort that out, which is which? Well, if you have a good overview of how does it all work, how is it that, you know, Buddha's saying that, uh, you know, this physical reality is an illusion? You know, what does that mean? How would, you know, how does that translate in scientific terms? Then with this over theory, you can explain it. You can say, well, here's what the theology, here's what they were really talking about because it's logical now, it's scientific. And here's the paranormal part. Oh, well, it's normal now because it follows from this one overview, this one understanding. Um, here's how these, uh, uh, what, reverse causality experiments work that have been done. Uh, here's how people at Pair Labs can modify uh, statistical distributions, if you will, of the way things happen mind uh, affecting physical things and then you can answer all those questions why is it that a man can use his intent and in feeling good or feeling bad and make ice crystals freeze into pretty crystals or ugly crystals how does all that work and then once you have an over theory that explains how all that stuff is and the same over theory also explains quantum mechanics and physics and does good science answers those things then you have an understanding that can bring it all together and it's all rational, it's all logical, it all kind of falls out in a pattern and then that's, that's, uh, then it becomes science. But until we have that, then it's description. This person said that, you know, and they go on with a, with a, a story and their story is perhaps very credible or not, but it can't be a, you know, it can't be science until we understand how that story might work, you know, kind of the causality of it, if you will. If you understand the causality of it, then it can become science. So I, I agree completely with what uh, Dean had to say. Yes, you find lots of literature, uh, you know, Taoism, if you read uh, Tao Te Ching, Tao, Tao Te Ching, I guess something like that. Um, you can see the same sorts of things turn up in culture after culture after culture. And, and then when you finally understand what they're talking about, well, it applies here too. You know, it is a bigger picture, but we, we, need a, we need the next step up to where what the Buddha said, why particles ought to be probability distributions, why the speed of light is a constant, all to derive from the same basic understanding. And that's, you know, that's the my big toe. Basically, that's where I'm. That's where I'm coming from. Could I ask a question? Sure. So, uh, within the, your big toe, mm -hmm. uh, is there a small toe too? Um, 
Well, you can break it up into smaller toes. You can just explain, say, quantum mechanics or, and relativity and see that they both come from the same understanding. And that's basically what Einstein was looking for. And we could call that a little toe. Um, so, so you can just apply it to the, to the physical part, and that would be a little toe. But then if you expand it and see the larger part where the paranormal, and paranormal just means that it's outside what physics or science now calls normal. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not so how, how do you apply the big toe to uh, things like quantum observer effects? Like how, how would it resolve the quantum measurement problem? Okay, it resolves, it resolves that problem by, by understanding exactly what's going on and, and what the mechanics are. The, you know, the double slit, let's say, is a kind of a fundamental thing in quantum mechanics. And as Feynman said, if you understand the double slit, you can understand the rest of it. That's kind of a, a key thing. And if you understand that reality is information, if you live in an information system, then we can call that a simulation. That's what simulations are. They're information systems. They're a, a virtual reality is a reality that's created out of information. Mm -hmm. So if our reality is created of information, we can look at it like a simulation. So once you start with that, and once you understand the structure of how that works, one of the attributes of this virtual reality is that there is a, uh, it's a, it's a probabilistic. It's not a deterministic virtual reality. So if you had a deterministic virtual reality, you'd have to have a piece of data for everything. Mm -hmm. Every particle, every state of every particle would require a piece of data. That becomes unwieldy and unnecessary. This is a probabilistic, statistical virtual reality. So you don't need all of that, you know, all that detail is unnecessary. You have a, what I call a, the um, probable future reality. And what that is, is a, a, basically in this information field, what's the probability that this will happen next delta t? And by next delta t, now I'm using something from the uh, simulation. You know, simulation cycles every delta t. Mm -hmm. So next delta t, what's likely to happen? And that's just, you know, trends, what you've got you know, extrapolated next. And then you can say, well, given that that's true, what would happen next, and so on, you can work sure. this out. Of course, it gets rattier and rattier the further you go because you're piling up all these assumptions that what happened was actually what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So it's just probable. Now, one of the, I guess if you understand the reason why kind of we're here in, in this interaction is to learn and, and grow up. So we're in a learning lab. Okay, and, and we uh, interact, we make choices, we have free will. And as we make these, these choices, we evolve the quality of our consciousness. And in more scientific terms, that means lower the entropy. In an information system, you have randomness is noise, high entropy. Mm -hmm. Information then is a low entropy arrangement of the bits, if you will, a lower entropy. So the, uh, the way consciousness evolves is by lowering the entropy the subsets of the information system, which are what we are. All right, now in this learning lab, to make it more useful and more educational for us, you need feedback. In any good schoolroom, you need feedback. And one of the feedback, there's, there's several feedback mechanisms, and one of them is that our intent modifies the probabilities in this future probable database. So we can actually have some influence on what happens next based on our intent. And then, of course, if it happens, then we live with that. So it's like you kind of create your own reality in that sense. Mm -hmm. But it's a multiplayer game. You don't create everything. It's not that you're a lone center of the universe and everything's created for you. It's a multiplayer game. So then that gets back to the double slit. So everything, then, is just probability before it becomes the present. Everything in the future is probability before it becomes present. In the present, then that's where we are. Things happen, we interact, and we make choices. And then after that, that becomes part of the, the past. And that's also probability. So the future is everything that could possibly happen and the probability that it might. The past is everything that did happen, which is our history thread, and everything that could have happened but didn't, and that's and the probability that it might have happened. You know? So again, we have all this probability uh, simulations. So think of the idea that it's all probability until it gets to the present where 
we're interacting with it as units of consciousness. So everything is probability to begin with. Well, particles like electrons, like photons, like buckyballs, all of these things, in a virtual reality, you only, everything begins as probability until somebody demands it in a measurement. In other words, until, until you open your eyes and look, there's no sense giving you a data stream that has the information in it that's what you're looking at. And what's behind you, there's no sense giving you a data stream on that. It's only what you're looking at. So you only get Who's a data stream. Who's doing the giving? The uh, larger consciousness system. You see, a natural system that's in the process of evolving. And in order to evolve, just like biological systems, it found it more organization, lower entropy, more information to divide, break itself into pieces, and interact cooperative as a, you know, cooperatively as opposed to just one monolithic th thing. Mm -hmm. So that's then the system, is, the, is the, um, this information system. I just call that the, you know, the, the, larger inf you know, the larger consciousness system. So that's the system where pieces of that consciousness, and we're helping the larger system evolve as we evolve, because if we lower our entropy of our consciousness a little bit, the whole system, we're part of that system, so the whole system lowers it a little bit. So it's just a natural evolving system that, you know, survives by lowering its entropy, by not letting its entropy grow, which means move toward randomness. Right. And we're just a piece of that. So then you have particles, their probability. That's just their natural state is a probability distribution until they need to be rendered in this multiplayer game. Well, in a multiplayer um, game, every player in the game gets their own unique data stream. So if you're working a player on a game, you're getting the data unique to that player, to where they, uh, you know, where they are, what they're doing, where they're looking, that sort of thing. So every player gets a unique data stream. And that's the rendering. Once something gets rendered, to you, then that's information that brings that into this reality frame. Once it's in the reality frame, it has to stay here. We can't look out this way and, you know, we're in California and then look again and now we're in Florida or someplace. Once you, you have a, a historical consistency constraint on it, otherwise it would be a kind of a crazy funhouse reality that wouldn't make sense, wouldn't be a good learning place. So once you measure it, that brings it, or in quantum mechanics talk, you know, it collapses the wave function, brings it into a, a piece of data that's now in this, this virtual reality. So then it has to stay that way. So if you look at the double slit as information, and you realize that it's not really the measurement, it's not the consciousness, although it takes a consciousness to make a measurement, it's really the information. And once you, once you see that, you can predict all the results of all the different kinds of double slit and the, and the erasers and all of that just fit perfectly consistently and it makes perfect sense. You know how, um, you know, you have the, um, I'm trying to think of that, what that experiment was called anyway, and in about 2000, there was a group of researchers who did a very neat double slit experiment where they had particles came into a, a plastic that then, when the particle hits, it puts out two. You know, so you get an entangled pair uh -huh. that come out of that. And then they use one, hits, a, hits the screen, and decides whether it's, uh, you know, where the particles land, what the distribution is. Uh -huh. The other one, its twin, goes through a, another process which either will or will not determine which slit it went through. But it doesn't make the first decision in that process of which slit it went through until after the other one's already been captured and it's mm -hmm. a done deal. Yeah, it's a late choice. Yeah, it's a late choice, yeah. So it's erasure, basically. It's right. a, you know, you have erasure experiment. So you have captured this data, then some 10 nanoseconds later, but 10, nano, 10 nanoseconds or 10 years really doesn't make any difference. Right. Time's not the issue. You make a choice over here, or it makes the choice, not the experimenter, but it makes the choice, depending on how it goes through a half silver mirror, or several of them, as to whether it keeps the information and says what slit it went through, or erases the information and doesn't have it. And of course, then you look at all the points, and all the ones where you kept the information, what slit it went through, all the slits that correspond to that one that you collected up here are all two little spots behind each slit. Right. And every time that 
you erase that information, you get a distribution that's in a you know, diffraction pattern. So all of that is, then falls out as being perfectly understandable and predictable from, you know, from this theory. And the thing that's, that it does really for quantum mechanics is it says, why should particles be probability distributions? Because that's what quantum mechanics assumes. Quantum mechanics starts with particles aren't really hard things, they're probability distributions. Mm -hmm. And based on how all this probability gets computed, you end up with a result. And quantum mechanics has been very, uh, it's been correct. The results they compute with the quantum mechanics, then they measure in an experiment and they get that result. So it's based on probability, but they don't have a, a clue as to why a particle should be a probability distribution to begin with. That's just an accepted, well, that's the way it is if you want to get the right answer, but there's no explanation. And that's why Feynman you know, told his students, just shut up and calculate. You know, uh, don't ask me questions like that. But in this theory, it explains exactly why they have to be there. And the thing that's interesting is that it also explains relativity's core point, which is why the velocity of light's constant. Because once you know that the velocity of light's a constant, then special relativity is really just algebra. It's not even very high level math. And then general relativity, of course, flows out of special relativity. So the key thing there is that the speed of light is a constant. That's what allows all these other tricky things like time dilation and length contraction. They all come out of this fact that even though you have a light source on a moving platform, the light that emitted is always constant, C. And uh, it's, it's invariant to the velocity of the source. And nobody knows, of course, why that is, because nothing else in this reality frame acts like that. Everything else, the velocities are additive or subtractive. You know, they depends on the platform. But in a virtual reality, you see that C is just in this virtual reality, it's moving data from one cell to the next. So you have little uh, uh, discrete quantum chunks of volume, if you will. And if you're going to move information from this chunk to this chunk to this chunk, as fast as you can do that is C. Mm -hmm. And it's a function of delta T going around. Every delta T, you can move it to the next chunk. You can't jump chunks and go someplace else. That's teleportation. And again, you get a funhouse reality. It's not, it's not buttoned down and consistent. You don't have continuity. Calculus goes away. All sorts of things don't work anymore if you don't have this continuity. So then that's why C is a constant. So it, it does, you know, it solves those problems that are the big, we don't know. Well, we can assume C is constant. We can work out all this wonderful relativity. And we can assume particles are probability distributions. And work out all this quantum mechanics. But we really don't know why that ought to be that way. Mm -hmm. And then this explains why it's that way. And then it also explains the parallel well, So in a sense, it, uh, it, it's as though we're living in the, in the movie The Matrix. Mm -hmm. right? And it, that's, that's a sort of virtual reality that... Yeah, that's that a good Hollywood of. version of that, right. Yeah. Uh, so, it, so then uh, what comes to mind is the, uh, the old uh, parable from Plato that we're, what we see of the world is a projection mm -hmm. of something behind. Right. Uh, just like looking at the movie The Matrix is Plato's cave all sure. over again. Sure. Uh, it, it also suggests that you, it should be possible to create an actual simulation on a computer mm -hmm. that that would demonstrate a lot of what you're, of what you're saying exactly. because the metaphor is very close. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And you know, people who work in consciousness and computers, uh, mostly they they, ha they seem to have mistaken idea that you can build consciousness into a computer, like you can somehow prog program a computer to be conscious, but it doesn't work like that. That is something that you, you can't do. What you do is you set, up the, you set up the environment that will support consciousness, and it just happens. You don't have to program it. All you have to do is give it the environment, give it the right stuff it needs, and what that is, is it has to be something that, that uh, makes decisions from experience. Mm. It, uh, those decisions can't be you know, algorithmic. They have to be fuzzy logic of some sort to where it takes in data. None of the data is so precise that it can give a deterministic, oh, here's the solution. The data is never quite enough to do that. So it has to say, well, 
eh, maybe this is the solution, or maybe that, or here's my probability on things being the solution, until it gets in more data. Well, data is called, the data input's called experience. So as it goes through its environment, it gets experience. That experience gets, gets uh, into knowledge, if you will, but it's tentative. The way you think things are kind of knowledge, and then it makes decisions. So if you can make that kind of a system, that's very simplistic. There's a few other things that it needs to be able to do. It needs to be self-changing. You know, it needs to be able to say, well, that didn't work out. I thought it would be this way, but now my more experience says that was a bad choice. So then it can change and do things differently. So it has to have some processing that assesses the results of its experience. It has to have a, uh, a goal, something it has to have, um, maybe a goal isn't the right way, but it needs criteria by which it can decide, is that good? Or is it better this other way? I mean, otherwise, anyway, is as good as any other way. You know? So it needs some sort of, some sort of uh, point to its existence. And in you know, biology, that point is what procreation and survival. In an information system, it's lower entropy. Create information. You know, shuffle, shuffle the digits to where they're more significant to you in some way. And, so it all could be simulated. Yes, it could all be simulated. You create the environment and it will become conscious. It's not a, it's not a matter of, here's how we program consciousness, because as, as soon as you try to do that, you've restricted it to the algorithms, mm -hmm. and now you have some kind of deterministic thing that can't do anything but go through your code and come up with the same answer if you give it the same inputs, mm -hmm. and that's not consciousness, you see? So it's a matter of developing the right, uh, the right environment and then letting it be. Now, when you do that, you're not immediately going to get you know, a consciousness that says, oh, hello, I'm the computer, you know. It's not going to be human consciousness. It might be consciousness like a bumblebee or consciousness, you know, like a dog or cat or at some other level, but it will be consciousness. It will be making decisions, and based on how those decisions play against the criteria of how it judges what it's doing, then it will modify, and it will, if it has the capacity, you know, a bumblebee is conscious, obviously a dog's conscious, you know, by conscious I mean it's sentient, it makes choices. Mm -hmm. If you poke it, it responds, and not just in a, not just because neurons are firing, it's not just in a programmed biological, you know, way. It responds by choice. It always has more than one choice of how to respond, and it can pick one, and that's basically how I define free will. Free will is that you have this decision space, which is all the decisions that you might make. Not all the decisions that are possible for you to make, because some might be possible that you don't, aren't aware of. But just all the ones you're aware of, and you get to make the choice which one you're going to do based on data that you get. So that kind of defines free will. So you can program free will, you see, in that sense. You can program it because you can program a thing that has choices, and it makes it based on its experience and what it's, what it's determined about that experience. And uh, so then that's, that's kind of, you know, the free will. So all of this falls together and then you can, it's just a real clear explanation like on your, your uh, video, your YouTube video where you were th at the, um, in New York. The okay. the, yeah, the Theosophical Society. Yeah, Theosophical Society. Get spit that one out. Um, you went through a series of, of research. Uh, things that uh, had been done, and you had done most of them. At least other people may have started it, like the, uh, the very first one you talked about. What was that? The, uh, where you put the... the uh, oh, the Gonsville yeah, telepathy. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that one where you put the ping pong balls over the eyeballs and so on. Um, all of those then have a... It's, you can derive them from this logic and say, yes, that'll happen, and yes, that explains that, even to the point where sometimes you would get a reaction before the actual stimulus occurred. So, you know, where you expect this person to send a signal to that person and get a reaction, actually the second person in the chain starts to react before the first person in the chain gets the signal. And so how does the, the big toe explain that? Oh, well that, that comes out uh, for two, a couple of reasons. One is that there is in this, like in any digital, um, you know, virtual reality, you have a certain amount of video lag. Video lag is kind of the, the problem between when you, when you compute and when it actually happens. You know, so 
we have a lot of video lag in our systems because they have to go through from the server, you know, to the to the internet, you know, to a local server, into the computer, how fast your card is, and all that stuff creates video lag. Mm -hmm. In this reality, what creates video lag is what has evolved here, and again, evolved in the simulation. You might say in the you know, digital Big Bang. What's evolved in the simulation is these us. You know, this is our our uh, biology you know, evolution of our systems, but that's evolved in a in a simulation. Our evolution. Okay, so we have these real slow responding things called bodies. They're electrochemical. They're physical. They're levers and you know, tendons pulling, you know, muscles pulling on tendons that, you know, pull up arms. So you have, you know, you have levers, you have fulcrums, you have electrochemical things that get emitted by this gland and it moves down here and does something else so that you have these very slow processes compared to the system which runs these delta T's at about 10 to the minus 44 seconds per delta T. So that's small. You know, that's like, what, four orders of magnitude no, something like 30 orders of magnitude smaller than the smallest thing we can measure. So it's real, real tiny, 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So that's kind of the computation time, if you will. Mm -hmm. But now you have these very slow moving things going on. So there's a little video lag problem between the data stream and the action. One of the ways you speed that up is you look at the probable reality start the action moving before you actually get the stimulus so that by the time the stimulus comes, you've gone through all the slow processes and actually start to see something that looks like it's with the stimulus. If you don't do that, then we'd have this delay. Something would happen and not, you know, you'd sit there and stare blankly at it and then you'd start to move. So we have, a, we have that process that gets you out in front. And that's why, you know, what was it, like the readiness potential, where they measure, if you go in and measure these little tiny, tiny uh, things in the musculature and in the secretions and so on, you start to see these reactions that precede the stimulus. That's getting the system going mm -hmm. so that it'll be moving. That's one, so that's, you know, kind of a video lag and the fact that there's this huge amount of time that it has to deal with. It's got billions and billions, actually four billions in a row, a billion, 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 billion cycles just you know, to get us up to a nanosecond of our real time. Okay. So that means it's got all this processing time and it knows the probable future very closely because we're only one, you know, times 10 to the minus 44 seconds to the next probable future. Well, if you're taking probable future leaps at that small a bound, it's not that hard to, you know, to guess what's going to happen next in the next, you know, one, 10 to the minus 44th second. That's a pretty easy calculation to make if you have all the data. Mm -hmm. So it kind of knows what's going on. It knows what's happening. Uh, it can start the processes going. If it turns out that free will doesn't agree with what it thinks is happening, then it has to back up and deal with that. So we have free will. It thinks, well, he's going to do this, and instead it does that. Well, then you have to recalculate from there out for a while, but it's just that one instance, and that probably happens less than it happens. So this the other way. sounds like it, it might account for a couple of seconds, but what about cases of months or years of, of knowledge in advance? Well, that can happen, and I've had I've had uh, a fair amount of personal experience with those sorts of things, where things were told to me that were going to happen, but they're going to happen 14 years from now. You know that sort of thing. How does that work? Well, you have a you have a system that is trying to evolve, not die. We're part of that strategy to evolve. So the system has a vested interest in us succeeding. So now we have a friendly system, if you will, in, in as much as it would like us to, to you know, it can't just go in and move the pieces around. Obviously, now it's bad science. You're not letting, you don't have free choice anymore if you're going to move the pieces around. You have to let them do what they're going to do mm -hmm. for it to count. So, but you can nudge those pieces. You can do things not making the move for them, but you can nudge, and that's kind of where synchronicity comes from, where things are just kind of nudged into place so that you get just what you need, just at the time you, you needed it, and it all works out really well. And people who 
kind of live in the live in the moment and don't try to control and just kind of you know live that way find mostly that they get what they need things happen and, and it tends to be good and the system tends to nudge you this way or nudge you that way so you can predict something that's 14 years out and it's not that there's some deterministic process going on that, that makes that have to happen it's that if that's a goal the system can kind of nudge that into happening and if it doesn't always happen well that's not a disaster not a perfect system the system is not perfect this it sounds just works. a lot like the movie uh, the adjustment bureau <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it yeah. sounds exactly that. like that yeah. Yeah. because it's they're they're watching uh, a system play out over time, mm -hmm. and their job is to nudge. Yeah. But they can't. They don't. They don't override can't control. Free will. Right. It's like that. So the system can do that, and it can. You know, a lot of times when people have these paranormal experiences, you know, the the mother suddenly knows that her child her child is hurt somewhere, and she just knows it, and it turns out that it's true. You know, many of these these kinds of experiences aren't really so much about the experience itself. It's about kind of opening the eyes of that individual. It's like it's it's more about that individual than it is about the fact that the child's hurt. Okay, they know about it. They can go. They can interact with it. But most of the time, the child would have been all right. Somebody's taking care of that over there. This connection's made because it helps that person and the persons around them that understand it and know about it and it makes sense to them, it helps them see a bigger picture. So a lot of that stuff that just happens. I had a, an engineer friend of mine who was, have said that it was very, very straight. You know, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist or it isn't, it isn't important. And uh, he uh, one night had a dream where he saw an airplane full of people. He was a kind of engineer that understood airplanes and he knew the makes and the models and those kinds of things, a technical guy. And he saw this airplane and says, oh, that's a such and such a make and, and model. And he saw the people on it. And he, it was maybe 100 people. And they were all in black and white except one little girl who was in color. And he looked at them, lots of detail. He says, just as much detail if he was there. It wasn't a dreamy kind of foggy thing. It was precise, like photographic. Two days later, a plane crashed. Everybody was killed but one little girl. Same plane, you know, same make, same model. And at that point, his life changed. You see, he became interested in finding out more about the larger reality. Mm -hmm. And you've heard stories like that, I'm sure, you know, hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. Things happen, and suddenly people get interested. They become seekers. You know, they, they, they know now that it isn't just physical, objective reality, that there's something else going on there that's bigger, and then that starts a process. And many of those things happen. You know, why? It wasn't really about those people. It wasn't really about you know, what was going on. Sometimes somebody will, will look at their fax and they get a message from Uncle Fred that's been dead a week, you know, sitting on the fax machine. Or they pick up the phone and they hear somebody from, you know, it's, from, it's passed on. So, in any case, these things are just things that um, are here to help wake us up, for the most part. They don't mean anything special in and of themselves other than to the individual that experiences them, because it's only really real for them and a few people close to them that they have credibility with. So a lot of things like that. So yeah, I was told, I was told, uh, uh, who, you know, basically, uh, you know, when I was going to be married, the number of children I would have and that sort of thing, decades ahead of when it actually happened. And when it happened, there, there it was. And again, it's, it's, it was just something I think that would help me, you know, help verify for me, that that's the kind of system we're in. When that started to unfold, did you get the sense that uh, you had to let it go, continue in that way, or that, like, it, is there a sense of uh, predestination? Well, you have you have a sense that that it's right, you know, that it go that way. You have the free will to say no, you know, I don't want that, and turn around and run, and that wouldn't happen. Well, so or you, it, you have it would still happen in some other way. That perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps it would, you know, that's, that's often true. If you deny one, you know, something will blossom on the other side. Right. You heal somebody's cancer and they get run over in a week, you know, by a car or something. You're not really changing the outcome so much as you're just modifying it. Right. But in, some, in that case, I had the sense that when I got in a situation where the bells were ringing, you know, the deja vu, the, the you know, yeah, I think this is important, 
I'm not sure why, but I just got this sense that you know, I need to do this and be that way. The sense was if I didn't do it, it wouldn't be right. Mm -hmm. you know, it was that kind of a thing. So it was, again, nudging as opposed to somebody making decisions for you. Mm -hmm. But the neat thing is, is not only does it explain these, these um, paranormal things, because all of the things that you talked about would have been deductive, if you will, from this theory. You could say, well, yeah, that's why that is, and yeah, that should work that way. And if I didn't know the answer, I could predict what the answer would be. Mm -hmm. But that's, so that's kind of the paranormal end of it. But the neat thing is that it tells you, well, why are particles probability distributions? And why is C constant? And how is it that people can modify So what, what aspect of the big toe is falsifiable? There's lots of parts of it that are falsifiable. There's any number of pieces of research that could be done, and some of them simply done, just to say whether it works that way or not. Can you give an example? Well, yeah. And uh, here's an example. And you know, we have this thing called uh, reverse causality. And there really is no such thing as reverse causality. It just appears to be reverse causality. And one of the ways this is done is that you take a, uh, you can take a computer. It's a simple way of doing it. The way it's been done, you take a uh, computer and make random numbers. And you make lists of random numbers. And nobody looks at the list, but there's just lists of random numbers. And then you can get people with an intent to say, let's try to make this list have a an average on a random number a little higher than that list, or make this list lower, you know, bias it. Uh -huh. Now, there's a principle I call sci uncertainty principle. You can't move it any more than what's in the natural uncertainty of the process. I mean, all processes are going to have plus or minus, you know, error, error bars along with it. So you can move it with your intent within the natural uncertainty. And you say, well, then that doesn't prove anything, but it does if you can do that 10 times in a row, that the ones you want to bias up tend to be up ever so slightly, right. and the ones you do ask down, that's like flipping a coin ten times in a row and getting heads. So it becomes very improbable that that's chance. So that's the sort of thing. And the reason it's called um, reverse causality is that these lists can be old. You see, you can take these lists, and they can be a year old, locked away someplace, and then you bring them out. And now people can look at it, and these can drop a little, or those can go up a little, and they can affect it. Uh, it's been done with hospital records, it's been sure. done with uh, uh, decaying uh, Geiger counters and a, and a radioactive decay, it's the same sort of thing. Well, what's going on there is that intent is modifying probable future. Probable future hasn't really happened yet. You see people say, well it has, that data's you know, a year old, it's done, it's, it's here, but it's not here because it's never been rendered here. It's not real data, just like that electron going through the double slit mm -hmm. until it's a measurement renders it here. Once it's here, then it has to stay here. Right. So where's the falsifiable aspect? Well, I'm getting, I'm getting to that. I'm sorry. I have to. It's, it's different enough that if I don't give some of the. Well, of course, I'm completely familiar with all this because yeah. I've done those experiments. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but maybe those the people, is not, those so. people are probably <laughs> yeah, not. Yeah. If it's a, if you have data, okay. Let's say we have uh, um, twenty thousand pieces of data. We break it up into um, 2,000, 10, 2,000 chunks of data, mm -hmm. okay? And then we take those, those 2,000 chunks of data and separate those into 1,000 chunks of data, all right? So now we can look at the, this, of this two 1,000 chunks, we can make this one higher and that one lower and so on. But now look at this. If, if we're going to, if, if this is just information, here's some fals falsifiable experiments you can do. You know, let's say that you, that you take this, these, this 2,000 of data and you look at what the average is of, both, of all that data, okay? Now, let somebody try to move this one higher and what will happen to the other one? It has to go lower by the same amount, you see? That's very falsifiable, it either does or it doesn't, right? Now you can take the whole ensemble of data, all 20,000 of them, take an average there. Well, you can modify this one and that you're one and this one and the other one. because you partially collapse it? I mean, you're constraining yeah, it. Yeah, you're constraining it and uh -huh. you're doing these partial collapses as you go. Because what's important, just like the double slit, is when, when you actually take the measurement, which means you go add up what's the average number from these streams of random numbers, that's when you collapse you know, the wave function and get a result that's now in this physical reality. Before, uh -huh. it was just a probable result, you see? Mm -hmm. So you can arrange, you can, you can change the constraints on it any number of ways to show that 
what's really going on here is that you have a digital reality. You're modifying the probability with intent, and by as you put constraints on it, they can do different sorts of things. Mm -hmm. If you look at the average of the ensemble, then they can change all the ones in between, but in a, you know, over the whole, it's got to hit that number that's already been collapsed into this reality frame. So that would be a whole set of experiments, not too hard to do, that would uh, kind of show mm -hmm. this, this process. In the 19, uh, see the late 60s or early 70s, there was a theory developed by a number of uh, parapsychologists called the observational theories, which, mm -hmm. which basically is the same idea, that observation acts to change the probabilities of quantum events. Mm -hmm. And that gave rise to a whole rash of different kinds of experiments of the type that you're describing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, in fact, all of it really has to do with the way that you constrain how a system behaves by your observation. Right. So right. The, many of those actually have already been yeah. done. That's good. Do they, do they verify the... Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So, that's, so it's like with the double slit, it's not the fact that somebody measures the data, because you can measure the data and then erase it, and you get a different value than if you have the data and don't erase it. And both times you've measured the data. One time you've erased it, now you're back to the diffraction pattern. And the reason that tells you that it's not the actual act of measurement, it's not actually the consciousness that did the measurement, it's the fact of whether or not the information is in this reality frame or not to create a, a conflict with what happens later. You know, what happens later can't be in conflict with what, okay, you, so with what you've got. Okay, so we've been doing experiments with a double slit system now for about four years and mm -hmm. continuing to do so. We, we do it in two different conditions. One, uh, you get feedback as to the state of how much collapse has occurred, mm -hmm. uh, in immediate feedback as a result of processing that we're doing on, in real time. Mm -hmm. But there's another condition where you don't get any feedback. So if you're mm -hmm. uh, mentally observing a double slit system mm -hmm. at a distance with no feedback, mm -hmm. what, what, what would... Depends on what your intent is. What's your intent for well, that if system? You, if it, well, your, your intent is that it would, it would collapse. Okay, so if you, have an in, function, so if you have an intent, and if your intent is focused on a system that has uncertainty in it, you know, it could be this way, it could be that way. You know, there's little tiny things that make a difference in those, you know, we're only talking about moving things, uh, you know, half a wavelength to make a big difference in how things work. So you have a lot of, of uncertainty. Well, where there's lots of uncertainty, intent can get a pretty good grip because there's lots of ways it could be. So now the intent can be fairly effective where there's so lots of uncertainty. So it, uh, uh, intent alone without observation or without? Intent will modify the future probability then when you make the observation, you collapse that future probability. If you've changed the probability with the intent. So you don't get the observation. So, well, it's, okay, so, so the intent can push the probabilities around you. You may right. or may not get a certain result, but if you don't bring it into this reality, as, right. as you were saying. It's then, still just potential. So you need feedback at some point. If you want to, you know, well, the probability will have been changed, okay? But whether or not you actually, that makes a difference. The way we get things in the system, the way you get a particle or a wave, is you go into a, a probability distribution of what is, po you know, here's, what, here's, here's what's possible and here's the probability of it being. Mm -hmm. So you go into that distribution, you randomly select one. Then that's your, that's then becomes part of this physical reality. That's here then. So what, you're, what we're saying then is you've modified the probability, you've skewed this distribution, but you've never done the measurements, you've never made the observation, so you never pick. Well, and there's no result other than you've skewed the probability. So the probability's been skewed, and if there's any other thing going on, any other forces in play that would re-skew it or do something else to it, then it might move again. But uh, so what I'm, if not, I'm it would to stay get at skewed. Here is something like another form of falsifiability here, because there are lots of theories uh, having to do with intentional effects on the world that require mm -hmm. feedback. For, for this very reason, that you, something about consciousness or the mind or whatever mm -hmm. it is uh, pushes probabilities around, but the probabilities are just sitting there like a superposition without actually doing anything, and it has to manifest. Yeah. And so the manifesting is the feedback that the person gets 
to close this loop between intention and observation. Yeah. Even if they don't close the loop, though, it will have that effect. If they if they focus well, on wait a minute. if you don't measure it, how would you know that? No, it some, no, I'm saying you don't have to necessarily feed it back to the person doing it. Somebody with the else. Intent. Somebody else somebody, would work. Okay. You see. So, uh, so if, if you don't make the observation, then you don't have any data. So there okay. there somebody is nothing in this physical. Somebody at some point has to get feedback in order to collapse the system that is or it's not part of this reality I got it okay. as long as it's in probability it's not in this physical reality what about what, what is it what do you frame. say then about the like the distance between the person giving the intent and the person who's seeing the the final feedback is makes, there anything it makes no difference okay. makes no difference at all this is a in this um, larger consciousness system there is no such thing as distance or space it's um, you know it's an information field now we visualize that as a bunch of things that are spatially distributed because that's the way we, you know, it's our habit, the way we have to see things, that's our experience. We, right. we can't visualize it any other way, but there is no distance there. It's just an information field. So, it do, you know, distance is not a, is not really a parameter that makes any, any sense there. It's just information. And the information doesn't really have to travel distances. There's just metaphors we use to, you know, to put it into language. Mm -hmm. So no, it shouldn't make any difference, and it won't make any difference whether those people are in shielded rooms or not in shielded rooms, unless they think it'll make a difference. Then their intention changes. If their intention is this is impossible, I can't do this now. Yeah, this is one they of the reasons they won't that, work. You know, won't work very well. This is one of the reasons why, uh, from a mainstream scientist point of view, they're always suspicious about psychic phenomena because nothing matters. And what you're saying is there are parameters that can get pushed around, but if you have a combination of Intention pushing probabilities in a non-local way. Right. Then anything goes. And yeah. In pretty which much. case, then. It, but yeah. that's the whole Anything point. goes within certain limits of the amount of uncertainty and so on. You know. Well, it, which you, is you, everything. So well, well, you know, let's, let's take for instance another good example is you have um, uh, Bill. Is that right, Bill Tillman? Tiller. Tiller. Bill Tiller, looks at a beaker of water or somebody does in his lab and tries to raise or lower the pH and the pH can creep up or creep down depending on the intent. Mm -hmm. Well, the way that works is that the pH of a glass of water isn't a, isn't a constant. If you had a, a pH at five decimal places, you'd see in the last three or four of those decimal places, it'd be, going, it'd be doing this all the time. Right. There's uncertainty there. Well, within that uncertainty, he can modify the probability of what's gonna happen next. So he raises it a little bit and then he's got a pH that's now 0.01, whatever, higher than it was. But now that's the state, and he can raise that in a little bit. So if he keeps at it, he can just walk it up a little delta T or a little delta pH at a time until he can measure it, and he's got a whole pH or a half a pH or something massive. He can't just look at it, and suddenly he's got a, a pH. See, that won't no, work. It's all about pushing Maxwell's demon around. He has, to, he has to work it up, you know, by the natural uncertainty in the you know, in that system, right. and he can, he can change that. So then you do the measurement. He changes it, and you what, do what the measurement. What about this as a, uh, as a kind of an experiment? Uh, if you have two people who have competing intentions, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're pushing on the same probability distribution, I wonder if you can show that two intents will create a kind of a churning in the probabilistic state of the system, whereas one would, would produce less. And maybe three people would have even more churning. Now, I don't know exactly what churning in a probability mm -hmm. distribution looks like, but I'm imagining something like, uh, like, like a chaotic system where you mm -hmm. would normally have a, a reasonably well-patterned uh, mm -hmm. binomial or, or Gaussian distribution. But when you start put having people push on it, you end up with things that have funny bumps right. in it. Mm -hmm. you, would you expect something like yeah. that to be Yes, started? Yes, you would. And it would, be, it would depend on who the individuals were, how much... How much power, let's say, they have in their intent. Again, power being a, a metaphor. Okay, how much power they have in their intent. Somebody who can focus well will have much more power than somebody whose mind is flying around and not focused. So if you had a person who had really good focus and a person who didn't have much and they were pushing in opposite directions, well, the person who had more focus would just overwhelm the person that didn't. But if you had people of relatively equal focus, pushing at an event, then yes, you'd, you'd find it, you're so you, going so to you, make bumps, so you you're going to make up, bumps in it. You'd have something like a Gaussian distribution uh, that would end up being bimodal. 
in which case if two people are doing an experiment with opposite, about the same intention, yeah. whatever that means, you should get larger variance. If they're pushing at each other, yeah, you get a larger variance yeah. because it would, it would, uh, it would split the, the it would kind of change this way pieces. some and that way and it would be, uh, yeah. Well, there's a doable experiment. Yeah. See, I didn't know I had these experiments in the past on that, on those, uh, you know, reverse causality sorts of things that they had done the constraints. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that because yeah. I thought that would be a good one. That wouldn't be that hard to do, you know. Yeah. Well, and you could see the many constraints. Many things have but, been tried. Yeah. So you, you so could do things. experiments with random numbers. I mean, the, there's all there's sure. easy ways of doing that right. kind of thing. And right. Paralabs has been doing that for. Two generations. Yeah, but but it was, it, the same experiment, more or less, yeah. over a long time. But if you come up with new designs, it's relatively easy to take a Cyleron or some other mm -hmm. device and program yeah. a little thing and try it. Yeah, I suspect with your uh, um, being a, an experimentalist, that uh, between the two of us, we could come up with you know quite a few of these predict something that's never been done before, and then go do the experiment. Let's do it. I'd really like to do that, too. Okay, we got to end this, because we're, we're working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be wonderful, because yeah. there's no point. I mean, the theory isn't any good if it doesn't So here's know, something doesn't we're, work. we're on the, in the process of building. Uh, we have a, an online version of our double slit experiment. Mm -hmm. We're making a, a, an online version of a random number generator experiment as well. So the the it's going to be extremely simple to begin with because it's going to be part of another project mm -hmm. that we're doing. But the, the guts of it would be fairly easy to, to change. Like from, a, from the perspective of somebody who's using the experiment on, on the web, they, they see a squiggly line. A squiggly right. line is some kind of feedback, but the, what's actually going on underneath can be very complicated. Sure. So that, that could be a way yeah. of plugging in some of your ideas into sure. this and getting... All, you need, all you need in that complication is something with enough uncertainty that it's movable. If you get things that are, you know, that the uncertainty is in the 12th decimal place, now, unless you have measurements in the 13th and 14th and 15th decimal place, you know, it's just now not, not going to be good. Bits, so it's, yeah. I mean, it's, as long as you have things that have flexibility within the uncertainty, you should be able to move that with intent. Right. And the more focused intent, the bigger the push. That's how uh, placebo effects works. You know, it's intent modifying future probability. Hmm. That's how um, that's how I've, ice cubes are frozen. Pretty crystals are not so pretty crystals. It's intent modifies the way. I, you know, you hear the thing about no two snowflakes are ever alike. Huge amount of randomness in the way ice can freeze and the, mm -hmm. the structures it can take. So within that randomness, if you have an intent you can modify the future probability of how that intent plays out. Mm -hmm. So it... Uh, I think we've wrapped it up. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> nothing else left to talk about. <laughs> we can go get to work. Right? Yeah. yeah, so I think it'd be good. I'd love to, to uh, work with you and, uh, you know, produce some, some really tight experiments on things that have never been done before and make the predictions. That would be... I mean, that's what science is all about. I'm a scientist, too. You know, and uh, I would like very much to do that. That would be terrific. I was hoping we might end up someplace like that when I, when I came here. All right, then. You're the experiment guy. Well, you push the probabilities in that direction. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that would be, all, that'd be a whole lot of fun. Yeah, yeah if, if you're interested in the, in the kind of the, the long version of the theory, it's all on YouTube. So that you can find I've it. seen some of it. Yeah, you yeah. can you can find it there. I is, usually is have it a. In this too? It's like, is this uh, well, yeah, that was a, an interview. So I was responding to their questions, oh. and some of it's in there, but it's kind of however our conversation happened to wander around on that day. Mm -hmm. It's not focused really at that. In the in the YouTube with, um, like the Calgary one, I have a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Friday's just kind of introduction and a, a quick summary. Not a lot of data there. Mm -hmm. The Saturday is all the theory, which is the one you'd be interested in. And then the Sunday is the applications. Mm 
yeah. remote viewing, healing, that kind of stuff. How to do it? How does it work? What are the what are the parameters you can you can use to manipulate, and what are the parameters you, you can't? And what do you expect? And, you know, we talked some out of body stuff and whatever. It's kind of applications of it. But if you just look at that Saturday, you'll have all the pretty much all the theory. Okay. Wrapped up. So that'll be a, that would be a lot of fun. Okay. We got it. Anything else, boss? That uh, you uh, <laughs> y'all are wonderful. This wanna, is fun. Anything else you you wanted to? Well, uh, I, I um, we didn't know exactly how this was going to go. It's going brilliantly. Do you feel like you've gotten something out of this that you wanted, Dean? I I never want anything out of an interview. It's, <laughs> it's not about it's not about me. It's about what you want. Yeah, you I agree. Have, you have something for your viewers. Yes. Yes. We have quite a bit for our viewers, and I wonder if there was some way that we could, um, at the end, from both of your perspectives, based on where we are right now, what could our viewer do right now that might improve their experience of their consciousness, starting with you, Dean? Oh, well, that, that's easy. Uh, Good. Um, they should buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> this will improve your consciousness to such a degree you will not believe it. That's it's a true statement. Yeah. <laughs> and why is that a true statement? Well, because it's, it's based on empiricism. It's, it says that regardless of uh, what you may believe or what faith you have or whatever else, when you put certain ideas to the test in the laboratory, you find that they're true. Because essentially, an experiment asks the universe a question, and it gives you an answer. And if you're lucky, you ask the right question, and you're paying attention to the answer. Mm -hmm. So the answer says sure. here that a, a fair amount of things that people consider to be psychic are very likely to be true. What that doesn't say is that any particular experience that you may have is indeed psychic, might be a coincidence or a mistake, but that we know mm -hmm. in principle that they're true. So you've, got, you've actually proven to the satisfaction of your publisher and the people that are reading your book, that this is a solid experience that people are having, and it's beyond the, the business of maybe and what if and, and wishing. Absolutely. Science, science is not really about proof. Mathematics yeah. is about proof, and alcohol is about proof. <laughs> and, and logic is about proof as well. Yeah, right. But science is about, uh, about evidence. Mm -hmm. So what we can say is that for several classes of psychic phenomena, that the evidence is so far beyond chance and mm -hmm. very likely not to be artifacts or mistakes that for all intents and purposes the phenomena are real. Mm -hmm. But but I, I would not say that it's proven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just the terminology, you know, uh, none of it used to be a long time ago that physicists created laws, you know, and we had Newton's laws. We had uh, we had Maxwell's laws. We have all these laws, and then physicists got to kind of got to come up and from nature. The laws weren't really laws at all. You yeah. see, all the Violating. things they said were laws. Mm, well, actually, they're not laws. They hold in a certain area, and then scientists stopped using the word laws, and they stopped using the word. They started using the word theory. Everything is a is a theory now in the popular culture. Theory means you're making a guess. What's your theory on who done it? You see, and we kind of have this sense of a, oh, a theory is your, you know, you kind of make a guess or a swag or what you think it might be. But in science, that's not what a theory is. In science, a theory is, is a, is kind of a, a hypothesis, if you will, a, a model is another way to say it. And the point is, isn't do you prove it or not? It's does it work? Does the theory actually enable you to predict what's going to happen? Does it explain all the things you know that happened? Does it explain everything that people knew, you know, in times past? Uh, that sort of thing. So if the theory works, then it's a good theory. And but it's always provisional. It's always provisional because we've learned as soon as you start to believe that you know everything and you've got all the, <laughs> all the edges tied down, you just make a fool of yourself. So nobody talks about, you know, proof in science, at least not good scientists. Good scientists always leave it open-ended. You can always learn more and never say that you know the final last piece of information about almost anything. Yeah, very simple things, yes, you can do that. But as the structures and the things you're talking about are more complicated and complex, it's just either good theory or bad theory. 
and good theory works, and you know experiments verify it, and generally it has just a few very basic assumptions. That's kind of you know that's another thing of good theory, at least if it's fundamental stuff that we're talking about. If you have to have a lot of assumptions to prop it up, then even if you can kind of describe what happened before, well, you can almost make any theory fit if you have enough assumptions with it. So just Einstein had a quote that uh, it's like the, the point of science is to describe as much as possible with a few assumptions as possible. So that's the hallmark of good make theory. Make it as not simple that, as possible, but not too simple. Yeah. That was the other quote. Yeah. It's true that you have one Occam's razor here to make explanations as simple as you possibly can get it, but the simplicity uh, oftentimes is because our brains are little pea brains. <laughs> We're, yeah. we're simple. Nature can be yeah. incredibly complex, mm -hmm. right. but we, we tend to, to see simple mm -hmm. explanations as more elegant. But nature, yeah. I don't think, gives a whit of what we think. I mean, it's <laughs> no. way more complicated yeah. than any one individual can right. cram into their head. So can you prove it is really the wrong question. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. what's right. the evidence? What's the evidence? The evidence is really, really good. Yeah, the evidence is good. And you know, you look at the Pear Labs, and I looked at their, I listened to their little video. If you go up on Google, P-E-A-R, labs, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research, and they have a little video right up on their homepage, and he will tell you that if you look at all of their experiments done together in one ensemble, the probability that their results were just freak, you know, an accident, just happened that way, you know, random good luck, is less than one in a billion. Now, what, you know, what science works to that level of, of uh, you know, exactitude? Mostly if we get one in a thousand, we're happy, and one in 10,000, we're deliriously happy on most, most research, but one in a billion? Well, one in so, a billion is technology. I mean, yeah. it is. So like this, this device wouldn't work if you had error right. rates more than, you know, yeah, more than one in exactly. a billion. So it is the transition between the edge of what is known and things that are known well enough so you're able to make devices. Right, exactly. So here's Paralyzed, but see, they can't get their work published. They have a hard time taking it to mainstream scientific publishers, these are credentialed, you know, good scientists, uh, they're Princeton University, you know, not Cornflake U someplace, but <laughs> they have a hard time. And we have this problem with, well, can you prove it? No, well, then it's BS. That's not the, that's not the idea. They, they'll, they will tell you they can't prove it either, but one in a billion that their results are accidental, you see, that's, that's evidence. That's really, really, really strong evidence, but it doesn't, it still doesn't get a whole lot of credibility in the larger scientific community because it runs counter to the belief, the scientific belief that we live in an objective reality that you can't do that. That's not possible. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the problem we have. So we always, we, I, I get a lot of that too. Can you prove it? You know, and it's all, that's not, that's not really about that at all. That's when I hand over a little bottle, those little like airplane bottles they used to have of vodka. Like <laughs> 150 or almost 200 proof. You want proof? Here's proof. <laughs> That's the best we can do. Yeah. So, so, so I'd like to ask both of you in turn and, and starting with, with you Dean, as you look ahead 10 years, where are we going to be on these subjects? In 10 years we might be very close to where we are today. Uh, the science is a very slow engine to change. Uh, there could be a breakthrough, it could be a theoretical breakthrough, don't particularly see one on the horizon, uh, but you never know with quantum mechanics, there are all kinds of, of new strange effects that show up practically every, every week in science journals now. Uh, so maybe there's a breakthrough, maybe things will happen radically fast. It could be that the environment is changing fast enough so we'll be forced to make new decisions about what we're going to believe or not believe uh, because we don't have any choice about it. Uh, but if I had to guess, I would guess that 10 years from now we're going to be quite similar to the way it is now. Yeah. There will be more evidence, there will be better evidence in, in terms of psychic, mystical experience, that sort of thing, and what science can do with it. There may be a, an opening within the neurosciences for more interest in this topic because of increasing interest in meditation research. Uh, and I'm an optimist, so I hope things change quicker, but I, I don't know, obviously. Yeah.
Tom, where are we going to be in 10 years? Well, I, I agree with Dean. You know, if you look at, um, at how these ideas have been in our culture, you know, for, what, 6,000 years or more, uh, they've always been in the margins. You know, there's always been people who had a sense of the larger reality. Most of them have been called mystics or, you know, right-brained or, or whatever we call them, but they've, they've always been in the margins. There's always been paranormal things going on, records made, experiments done. Um, it's not like this is brand new and suddenly, you know, everybody's going to look at these experiments uh, that, that uh, Dean does and, and say, well, you know, gee, that must be right. They'll look at his experiments and they'll shake their heads and they'll go, yeah, but uh, it doesn't make sense. And then, and then they'll forget about it and they'll go on doing whatever he's been doing. So it's been in the margins a long time. I have hope. I'm, a, I'm an optimist, too. And I see that there's two major paradigm shifts that we need to get to and through. The first one is that reality is information, that this is not an objective reality. It's a subset of a bigger picture. You know, bigger, there's a bigger reality out there. And what we see here in this physical reality is a subset of that. Just like I said, uh, just like uh, Newtonian physics is a subset of quantum mechanics. So I think that idea is gaining. I've seen in the last decade a huge gain in the number of scientists that are taking the idea of this being a virtual reality and our reality being based on information seriously. So I see that as a growing, it's still in the margins. It's still even pretty far out on the margins, but, yeah, it's, but it's, it's respectable. It's That's, respectable. Yeah. You have a whole group now called digital physics right. that didn't exist before. And these are people who start from that premise that this is a virtual reality. Yeah. They publish in, in uh, you know, standard uh, traditional journals. Mm -hmm. So we're beginning to see, you know, a, a turning, I don't want to say we're at a turning point yet, but we're beginning to see that this has become credible. and. The fact is, it's just better science. You know, you can explain all these things that are unexplainable when you understand that reality is information. Suddenly, all this mysterious stuff just falls out as logical consequence. So I think that's the first step, is that, and I believe we're continually gaining. Ten years from now, that's a pretty short period of time. But I see this trend continuing to blossom and blossom and blossom because it's undeniable. Just like that the earth is round rather than flat, you know, that idea lasted a long time and was let go of, you know, uh, not very uh, easily. And today we still use the concept that the earth's flat. It's called surveying in small, small plots. You know, it's all flat earth uh, assumption. When you lay out a house, you know, a survey for a house or a shopping center or something, you assume the earth is flat. So it's a good approximation for short distances. Anyway, I see this as is a developing snowball rolling down the hill. It will, it will gather steam because it's better science. So eventually, the flat Earth kind of rolled up into a, you know, into a, a subset for short distances, and we got a bigger picture. And I think we're headed that way with with this. So that's step number one. First big big uh, paradigm that has to shift. Then the second, and that's going to create a ruckus. That's going to create a, a, a lot of dislocation in people's concepts. The second thing that has to happen is that then they have to realize, you know, when you say if this is, a, this is a, a simulation, the first question is, well, who's, who's the programmer? You know, who's doing the simulation? And the second paradigm that has to shift is consciousness is the computer. And then when we get those two together, suddenly everything from, you know, the Buddha saying that this is an illusion to, uh, you know, God is love to paranormal events to quantum mechanics and, and relativity and, and uh, reverse causality and all this stuff then just falls out with placebo effect, mental healing, you know, all kind of falls out as a logical consequence. And, of just, and step two just is going to be much more difficult than step one. Yeah, step two will be a, will be another huge step, but step one will be huge too because, you know, when you listen, uh, if you read Fredkin, and, and they said, well, where's it come from? You know, who's doing it? He said, other. He put quote marks around the word other. He says, don't know. Science doesn't take me there. It's just other. Well, science can deal with other. They just ignore it because, you know, that's the science doesn't cover other. They just cover it being virtual reality. But once the scientists, the high priests of Western culture, say that it's a virtual reality, 
And where does it come from? Oh, other. The population at large isn't going to just say, oh yeah, other, we just don't know about that yet and forget about it. <laughs> that's going to that's gonna throw in a grenade under the tent when right. other comes out. And you're going to have a lot of turmoil following that idea because suddenly science is now in the position of validating other as something that must exist because a simulation cannot simulate itself. So now we have the high priest of science validating that others is an exist well you can um, you can tell what that's going to do in general yeah, that's I mean, that, that's going to be a clash over creationism gonna, and intelligence oh design. it's going to be a, a huge <laughs> a huge be many mess. scientists who are not don't want to go there because they don't like right. like where it's headed exactly so that's going to be a big dislocation of concepts and ideas and, and people but that then the answer to that of course is what's other is consciousness it's the larger conscious system if it's information the simplest form of information is ones and zeros. You know, it's just the simplest thing. And if it's an information system, then it's, you know, that it's consciousness, and that this is a virtual reality, everything fits. From then on, all the, you know, all the uh, mysteries get solved and, and it kind of takes care of itself with a logical progression. So I see that as in the process. The snowball has already started rolling down the hill. This is a long hill. <laughs> it's going to take a long time to get there, but the fa you know, the more it goes, the faster it gets. So those are that's kind of my sense. I don't know whether that's 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. You know, these kind of ideas take a long time to change something as fundamental as our idea of what you know of what reality is. That it's physical, it's objective. Period. Otherwise, guess what? Scientific method doesn't work. Scientific method is based on an assumption of an objective reality. Mm -hmm. If it's a probabilistic reality, all experimenters doing the experiment anywhere aren't necessarily going to get the same answer. Scientific method has that as an assumption. That this is an objective you know, reality. So well, but that's, we the, already know that the, that's been violated through... Yeah, but we um, don't admit it. No, well, <laughs> uh, local realism and non-local realism yeah. both have been shown right. to not be true. So, right. it, and this is mainstream thought. It's just, it hasn't penetrated very far. Right, we just don't think, admit it. The other thing about a, a virtual reality model is that if, uh, if something, you have something running, it's a simulation, well, somebody can turn off the switch and reboot. Right. And so the, the, the hope is that the, the world will continue to spin nicely over the next X number of, mm -hmm. of centuries to give us the luxury, in a sense, of the luxury of science continuing to do what it does. And it is a luxury, because historically, science has not been on the, the, the heap of the totem pole. And it's, it's probably through that process, with stirring in a little ancient wisdom, perhaps, uh, that gives us the opportunity of actually advancing. Yeah. Because if, if, we, if we collapse too much into the direction of faith as the arbiter of truth, or, or too much in terms of people who don't have any time to think about it because they're worrying about tornadoes everywhere, uh, then, then it's a, like a very fragile walk that mm -hmm. we're walking, and I just hope that the future is stable enough to allow this evolutionary to continue. Right. I would agree. And kind of the, the race we're running now is whether or not that wisdom, ancient or whatever, you know, the wisdom of the people here is going to grow sufficiently that the technology that we're spawning, you know, is used wisely rather than destructively. And, and that's... Or, or it doesn't accidentally kill us. Yeah, it doesn't accidentally kill us, right. So that's kind of the, you know, the race we're running. We need enough wisdom and understanding and big picture idea of what's going on so that we don't run ourselves over with our cleverness. Before, before we get there, so. I'm still an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too, still an optimist. You have to be. Yeah. yeah. You, have to. you know, I think it'll be sooner rather than later, and when I'm talking about culture, sooner might be 100 years, but you know, cultural, big cultural things are like, you know, yeah, millennia, you know, half a millennia sort of thing. So when I say sooner rather than later, you know, 50 years, you know, 20, 50, 100, who knows? That's all about the same. That's kind of near term in cultural things. So I think it will be near term because we have the internet now. It used to be that uh, information took a long time to spread, a long time to share. And that's not true. You know, they talk about internet time being fast. Well, these things grow fast, change fast, and can be neglected just as fast. 
but we're on we're on a different we're in a different world now as far as information goes mm -hmm. and uh, ideas can spread and get worldwide in weeks that would have taken centuries so I think the snowball kind of picks up speed from the fact that this is the information age mm -hmm. and and uh, it doesn't it's not going to take what you know 200 years before you know the earth goes from flat to round even though the experiments were done and it was obviously round but it took 200 years before most people believed it mm -hmm. so I don't think it will be 200 years I think we'll be maybe in the next 50 I hope I think science has, has got to get to this virtual reality as a better physics so what we'd like to think is that the time you all have put together this afternoon is going to speed up that for people who are thinking about this and can get in touch with it and understand that you're talking about something that has the power to really reshape our world. And with that, Karen, say the magic words. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We're grateful for your time. We're so, it's been an exciting time to, to mm -hmm. listen to the two of you sharing information. And what if it really works? Thank you, Dean Radin. Thank you, Tom Campbell. You're very welcome. And thank you, too, for uh, bringing us together, Chuck and Karen, uh, kind of making it happen, setting it up, and dragging me out here and getting <laughs> Dean away from his desk and kind of making this whole thing happen. I think it's, it's been fun. Well, the thank pleasure you. is all ours. Thank you very much. Thank you both thank of you. you.